this morning. And welcome to everyone at home joining us um, on YouTube. I hope you guys are doing well. We're thinking of you, and we stand in solidarity with you as well. Well, t- uh, church may look a bit different, but uh, God's presence is with us, and that never changes. And so from that, we draw hope. So um, I've been wondering if um, you can remember a time when you had just started out in life, and uh, you may have just left school. Back in those days, people would ask you the question, so what are you going to do with your life? You know, what kind of career uh, do you want to have? Well, fun fact about me, um, my first choice was actually to work in the diplomatic corps, <laughs> or maybe at the United Nations. Um, I guess I had these grandiose visions of, of me traveling to far flung places, maybe to help alleviate um, some humanitarian crisis uh, somewhere in the world. So I went to uh, university and I studied that, and I was fascinated by history and international law, human rights, and geography. And so I have become not only a follower of the local news, but I like to keep track of what's happening around the world. It really fascinates me. And so I was watching uh, an international news station recently, um, and uh, a gentleman said something that really jumped out about out at me. <clears throat> he said, "You know what has really surprised me about the last? <clears throat> excuse me, I better take a drink of water. <clears throat> about the last few years, and you could hear the audience jump. Oh well, yes, it must be about COVID, and and of course." Um, It was in a sense, but what he said was quite profound. He said that the thing that really jumped out at him in the last three years is how humanity has responded in times of pressure. Most of the time, we tend to to respond in a good sense, but more and more we're seeing that um, it's bringing out the bad in us, this pressure we're under. I thought, you know what? That's really true. Gosh, I hope that I'm not one of those people that's not taking care of myself so that when the pressure settles on me, I'm I'm lashing out at others. I need some work in that area. I don't know about you, because pressure can really get to us, right? So I thought, well, let's have a look today to see what God might be able to say to us on the subject and how we might prepare ourselves for those times. Um, So while we are trying to make sense of it all, we might actually find ourselves, as I said, responding to others in ways that are not good. We might lash out at those around us because inside we're scared, we're angry, and we're afraid. In essence, the faults that we like to keep hidden from the world, and we do so when times are all peachy, seem to come to the surface in the moments of pressure, sometimes like a volcano erupting. And, and, you know, then people get to see who we really are in a sense, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'll call it today. Uh, and it's not a, pl- a pleasant place to find yourself in. And so often we like to divert our attention to others, you know, how bad they are behaving. And, and all the time we fail to see that we need to be looking in the mirror at ourselves. What are we bringing to the times we're living in? I mean, after all, they're crazy, right? (laughs) We're under so much pressure, so much stress. So I want to be, and I'm sure you want to be, someone that the world looks at and says, I'm encouraged by her, or he brings a bit of light into my world. And maybe when I'm in relationship with this person, I find hope again. So what is the solution to becoming this type of godly person especially under pressure. Well, first, I think we are privileged as Christians to be people who have a God willing to look on our good, our bad and ugly, and he loves us, and he wants to transform us into people of the light. In the secular world, the solution that they often punt is self-care. You must care for yourself before you care for others. That's how they they think that uh, things will work out better. And while that can uh, be good for us, I think sometimes it results in a bit of self-centeredness. And maybe we try to distract ourselves too much 
when really we should be facing head on those things within us that need to be changed, that God can give us help with. So I thought today I might focus a bit on what it means to learn to rest in God. You often hear this, uh, the words, enter into my rest. How can we do that really in a practical sense? So, join me as we turn to Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. Uh, I'm going to read it for all of us. And let's come up with a game plan that will help us navigate um, these issues in our time. I'm actually going to read from the NLT version this time. Hebrews is a really complicated <laughs> letter. And um, the words are often quite complex. So... NLT is a good version because it breaks it down into simple things. So from verse 1, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who had come to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshippers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices <coughs> excuse me, actually reminded them of their sins year after year, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, Look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the Scriptures. So the author then goes on to say, First Christ said, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy, by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all time. So I'm going to stop there now for a little bit. Let's get into that. So back in the days of the Israelites, God wanted to teach his people about themselves and about him. He wanted to showcase a way that they could process their good, their bad, and their ugly. You see, he knew that a heart turned over to him um, would actually begin to grow in its goodness. It would become less and less bad and ugly. And so he provided the Israelites with a set of tools that would help them to see the cost of sin. You see, the bad and the ugly, we all know, needed to be paid, and it's something that they couldn't provide, unfortunately, for themselves. So God provided a substitute animal an animal that lost its life for the penalty of sin we know is death, and it must be paid. And the problem was that they got a bit confused. They didn't see uh, the full picture. They thought it was all about the sacrifice that they brought before God that mattered. But, but not, that's what not, that was not what God wanted. God wanted them to see that he himself had given them this mechanism with which they could um, uh, bring their sins before him and he would temporarily um, forgive them. So this was a temporary measure until he could enact in time the most glorious part of his plan to give us his son as a true substitute. You see, because God is all good and just, no sin can enter into his presence. He's God. He's holy. And so he could very easily destroy whatever came before him if it wasn't good. Jesus, however, changed the picture. When Jesus came, we had our final solution. A perfect man, a man without sin, 
able to stand before God being the fullness of what it means to be good. He was accepted. God could accept him. And because of Jesus' ability to stand before the Father, he could come and gather up all our bad and our ugly, and he carried it on the cross, sacrificing himself for our sake as an expression of God's love to us. God provided this lasting solution. So you see, remember, Jesus was not just a perfect man, but he was fully God as well. So the first thing to to do and to acknowledge as a Christian is the love and grace shown us by Jesus, an innocent man that made all the difference for us, especially with our lack of innocence. This was a free gift from God, and so it should humble us. It should bring us to our knees in gratitude. When was the last time you paid the price for someone else? It's not common at all, is it? Only Jesus can do that. And so because of our debt being paid, we're actually able to toss off the guilt we would constantly be feeling now that God has ripped the veils from our eyes. And so we can then get rid of that guilt and begin to learn from him how to be a a human being in the likeness of Jesus. And the more you dwell on that fact and the more you realize that fact, you begin to see that there will become a day when we will stand with God and there will not be an ounce of bad or ugly in us or bad and ugly in those around us. That's a world to look forward to. And as you go through this process, two things happen. First, you find rest for your soul. You know, that guiltiness, if we don't allow Jesus to deal with us with it, um, and we accept his offering, we feel that guilt and we carry it and we never get rid of it. And that's not what God wants to do. He wants to take it away. He wants to leave us with an unworried mind. He gives us peace, contentment, and hope. And then he begins to teach us how to faithfully follow him, how to follow his ways, and allow uh, he allows um, the Holy Spirit to be at work in us to get rid of all that bad and ugly that's in us. And then the goodness within us finally has room to grow and grow. Another fun fact, as many of you know, I grew up in Africa. And so I was exposed to the process of mining. During my early years, we actually lived on a mine. And so from time to time, we would visit places and see how they extracted gold and diamonds from the ground. And you become fascinated how God's creation works. The fact that a lump of coal under pressure for thousands of years becomes a diamond of infinite worth. Uh, you Growing up as a child, I don't know if you were, got told this, but they said if you hadn't been good, you'd find a lump of coal in your Christmas stocking. Did you hear that? <laughs> I was thinking about that, and I thought, wow, maybe there's a lesson in there for us. It's like the sacrificial uh, system uh, was for the Israelites. God wants to take you and me this lump of coal, and he wants to turn us into diamonds. We are on a journey to being formed into something precious. God wants to teach us how to walk faithfully in his ways, not only when times are good, but especially in the times of pressure. If you can be faithful and good under God's guidance and grace in the hard times, I think, then you found the secret to entering into the rest of God. So with all that in mind, let's continue to read the rest of the chapter. It's very well well written, um, so I won't need to explain it all, but at least now you have this context in the forefront of your mind. Let's see what it says from verse 11. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. 
Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Do you see that? And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Isn't that awesome? Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Do you see how what we've just been saying gets opened up to us in this passage? And then we have a bit of a warning. It continues, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those we have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if we were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge, I will pay back. He also said, the Lord will judge his own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you see how important it is in God's eyes that we continue to follow in his ways? We should be steadfast, faithful to him because of this great privilege we have received. We can no longer be hypocrites, people that follow God only when it's convenient for us. We should follow him all the more when it's hard for us. Or else, as the scripture says here, we make a mockery of what Jesus has done for us. And that would not sit well with the Father. We can't fluctuate being, uh, between being a piece of coal and a diamond. We must submit to God's work in our lives, knowing these things are the birthing pains of those being formed into the precious likeness of Jesus. Let's continue, and of course the writer of Hebrews is talking to the Jewish people here, but uh, there is a lot we can apply to our lives. From verse 32, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same thing. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now, so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you'll receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay, and my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not those who turn away from God to their own destruction. 
We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. There's a lot packed into that one chapter. So we need to have patient endurance, especially during stressful times. We need to hold dear in our hearts to the promises of God. That will help us to get through the hard times. And then we need to follow Jesus when it's easy and when it's hard. And if we should stumble on the road, then we remember the price Jesus paid for us. We humble ourselves and we continue on. Then we will truly become that rarity in the world today that remains hopeful and shows others his glorious light. So let's pray. Lord, we come before you, each one of us, coal in your mighty hands. We accept your teaching and accept the Holy Spirit at work within us to mold us, to cast and to shape us into a likeness more precious than diamonds, the likeness of your Son. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in the pressure when it hits us so that we do not cave under the weight of the world and its troubles and lash out, causing more suffering. Instead, may we be people of the light that bring your hope in the midst of suffering and love in the midst of despair so that no one may look at us and say they have witnessed our bad and our ugly, but rather your goodness shining out from within us. Amen.
know Jesus died for you. And let's be light in a world that sorely needs that. Let's be an encouragement to others. So God bless you this week. Take care of you and protect you as you go about your, your day. All right? We'll see you next time.